Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another evening of Northshire Live. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York, here with my colleague, David Wood, event manager in, at Northshire Bookstore in Manchester Center, Vermont. Um, David is going to introduce our authors this evening, but before we get started, I have a couple of quick announcements. Um, first of all, you may have noticed as you came in that this event is being recorded for future broadcasts on our YouTube channel. However, we have the settings set up so that it is only recording those of us who are unmuted and speaking into the yellow box. So if you want to have your video on, don't worry, you will not show up on YouTube. Um, we are not going to be recording you. Um, in light of that, if you have questions for our poets this evening, please put them into the chat. We will have time for some audience questions at the end of the evening, and you can type your questions in at any point, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and then last of all, before we start our event and, and Davith introduces our authors, a word of thanks. Um, it's been a, a hard year um, for small businesses and independent booksellers and event managers for that matter. Um, and we couldn't have carried on without the incredible support that we've gotten from our customers and our audiences. Um, and we're really grateful for that. So thank you so much for your ongoing support of Northshire. And without further ado, David, why don't you get things started tonight? Thanks so much, Rachel. It's my genuine pleasure to introduce Chantalee Gander for the publication of her new book, Ghetto Claustrophobia. Chantilly is a veritable Renaissance woman. She's a photographer, poet, investigative journalist, and prose writer. She is the co-author of Ghosts of Cuba. She works at Mount Island, a small press and magazine dedicated to rural LGBTQ plus and POC voices and artists. And for the Vermont Humanities Council, she lectures on Lucy Terry Prince, an enslaved African woman whose poetry predates that of Phyllis Wheatley. Shanta Lee joins us today to celebrate the release of her first full-length poetry collection, Ghetto Claustrophobia, Dreaming of Mama While Trying to Speak Woman in Woke Tongues, which you can order through a link in the chat box. Uh, we are very lucky uh, to be joined by fellow poet and visual artist, Bianca Stone, director of programs for the Ruth Stone House. She is the author of many books, books, including poetry comics, a little called Pauline, a children's book adaptation of a Gertrude Stein poem, the illustrations in a special edition of Ann Carson's Antigonic, and the Northshire staff pick, The Mobius Strip Club of Grief. My colleague uh, Joe's staff review calls it haunting, strange, and compelling. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire Bianca Stone and Chantalee Gander. Uh, Chantalee, why don't you um, start us off and uh, read and tell us a little bit about the book? Sure. So, um, yeah, I slowly started putting this together, actually, strangely, 2018, 200th anniversary of um, Frankenstein. And during a self-imposed writing retreat with a couple, with my husband and a couple of our friends, uh, I, so you trying to get that energy of how Frankenstein was created. Uh, I came out with some poems that were about growing up in Hartford, Connecticut and to a column street. It's like, what the hell is this? I wasn't expecting this, but decided to slowly like to go with it and then start thinking, oh, a collection, I guess. Okay, well, let me piece by piece without counting all the poems, try to put something together. So this has been uh, years in the making and I'll read a few poems from it. Uh, I'm going to start with forgotten tastes like cheese sour to the tongue while visiting mother. Here you banish sins of the day, banish what couldn't find its way into the pot, the rot in the corner, a veiled stench, and another there, you be balm. Self. You be sanctified, a part of how good got right, how right got us forgot how to get right. The closest we came feels kind of like the voices that reach in makes we jump. Not that kind of jump. The one hid in hate blue red doors, the one where the pulpit pimps be saying, you got to be ready when he comes rolling up in a chariot for when he comes, you ain't got time to be fussing. He be the boy from that other place causing her fuss. Maybe he'd be like she, theft in time. He'd be that boy from a place they wouldn't speak about. Both them letting the world think that their skin told its kind the truth. 
It was a kin's kind of truth. Tastes like braille built upon bodies, white space, ellipses, dashes. Honey, they don't teach that kind of code. The code wasn't in a book. Branches so tangled, tongues can't speak it. But mama's, mama's, mama's mama claps back from forgotten. Mama's, mama's, mama's mama standing at the edge of my bed. She's followed the yellow traces of the calendula to my pillow, reaching for my throat. Hers filled with daggers, disturbance, and time saying, girl, you didn't ask. <clears throat> that poem I just read was, uh, I, I've been so upset. I, this is going to sound super strange. Um, after my great aunt died, who was considered to be the family matriarch on my uh, mother's side, I, if someone said during a phone call, they were like, one of my aunts said, oh, she took a lot of secrets to the grave. And I became like, I still am a little bit obsessed. I'm like, well, what did she take to the grave? Can she tell me if she's on the other side? How do we talk to each other? So I, I've been so fascinated by family secrecy, which is some of, some of the themes in this book. Uh, the next poem is just thinking about not necessarily forming my personal judgment of the two individuals in the poem, the two, um, celebrity icons, but thinking about how our memories and childhood are painted in a certain way. Like you believe one thing and then, you know, other things may surface or come to light. And, and what does that do to your memories and the foundation of, let's say childhood. So this poem is surviving R. Kelly and Michael Jackson when they are your childhood's soundtrack. One. Sundays belong to Mahalia, but Monday was Millie Jackson's day. By Friday, mamas didn't know it yet, losing one sense to gain another, the ability to insert themselves in between the breath and space of each lyric that left his lips. There was no doubt he was singing about them. He was singing to them, too. He was saying to us, reminding us they didn't care about us. How could we question that? How could we break the big he became, giving original meaning to blurred lines we were never going to question? The same way we could never question this truth. We never stopped looking for how to get back. We figured if we can make mortals into heroes and heroes into gods, then there'd be no question. We were all in that image of holy, right? Three, we can't question the holy created by our own hand, no more than we can question the magician who made age slip into numbers, slip in and out of mouths of grown women as their daughters went missing. Lyrics became the Psalms we repeated as we became accomplices to our bodies, becoming ignitions, cars, Jeeps, or an endless hotel. He birthed relationships into existence, spoke babies into being. How do we question he who made us sanctified on the dance floor? Four, on the dance floor is where I would try to shuffle right, shuffle left, buck my hips. If I buck my hips hard enough, I become him. The beat and his voice take me back to that world premiere, the way he reinvented the thing we can't name. How would we ever find anything vulgar in that? Five, vulgar not, might not come close. It was proof turned pornography, black girl interrupted by viewing parties, all the women who said they would have taken her place. How many different ways did we all claim it wasn't him? Six, question, did they do it? Answer. That is not really the question. How did the mu music make us feel at our weddings, graduations, all those Saturday nights at the club? Didn't they remind us of flying with our feet on the ground? Question, did they do it? Answer, 
When our stories went missing, didn't they say they were the ones who handed them back to us? Question, where do I put the cassette tapes, the albums, the answer? Can we unpaint all the pain that's been on the walls and the rooms of our psyche? Can we remove the wallpaper from our childhoods? Question, where is the sin and the gods created and crafted by human hands? Answer, as gods go, they demand sacrifice. Question, what does a sacrifice to a god look like? Answer, our daughters, our sons, ourselves. Um, I will read you some from the interlude. <clears throat> so this is from uh, the day God's thermostat broke, ghetto claustrophobic dream interlude. Speaking of crazy, sometimes boredom has a way about it, a kind of saunter like it's twin trouble. They both show up when it's hot. See, trudging through snow or trying not to fall on ice don't work well for these two. Trouble and boredom manifested in a dude the color of one of the early spring flowers, color of forsythia. No government name, but a one word, two syllable street name. He was straight out of the Newport Pleasures ad, a cat with a slick look and what he bloomed, we didn't want. But like for Scythia, he appeared on time and within his season. He made us pay attention to the way day ate night, the way night ate the children who had to succumb to the endless ride in the purple Cadillac. He made us pay attention to what happened when mamas felt the heat of a broken thermostat when their husbands are at work the ghetto version of a bar hop. He taught us that people like houses are interchangeable. He taught us that like the endless tap in a bar hop, intoxicated cars stumble like the ones who had too many hunch punches. And when cars stumble in the heat, they hit telephone poles. Um, I'll read the last poem. Um, this one, it's more visual than anything because it, it has a lot of blacked out razors. <clears throat> Fun fact about this poem, um, Tavernier Chocolates is making some chocolate for an event off of this poem um, called Wake, a Spell. I'm looking forward to that. Wake, a Spell. Body pitched to the unseen. Don't darn all the holes, leave some for looking. Don't say all that is seen, leave some for those who gonna say. Wake. The skate, walls and mouths gonna say otherwise. Between wake and sleep, some gonna ask you. Between wake and sleep, some gonna dare you. You are the one who checked in here. No need to tell you, wake. Yours is a tongue tuned to telling. Stitch stories, darn trauma, weave joy. And for the unwritten, the never said, the never seen, raise up as if dead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shadali. That was fantastic. Um, and maybe now we can hear from Bianca, who will uh, share some with us for a bit before we have a little uh, conversation. Totally. That was amazing. I'm, I'm just really excited about this book um, and just everything Sean is doing. I couldn't be more grateful that this is happening in Vermont, you know, that, that there's really a great poetry community here. Um, and Northshire is such an amazing bookstore. I was just there last weekend, um, spending a lot of money. And it was great. 
I wanted to start by reading a poem from Ghetto Claustrophobia um, in honor of this, this beautiful book that I feel like such a kinship with. Um, my last book also is a similar cover, uh, but just, you know, this endless exploration of um, family history, um, all the complexities therein, and, you know, really trying to figure out what the hell happened to get you here? Um, because there's just so much we're dealing with on our own that we can't make sense of, you know? And it's, I think it's natural to look back um, at where we've come from to get more information. So I'm gonna read just a short poem called Roaming the Deadlands. His ghost hung in the attic apartment I was told to bury my face, hide from the naked, keep one eye open. You'll know what the forms are. They ask, what did you hear? Name nothing. We had no sight, silence, our braille as years do when they do passing, gifting, scattering. We still don't know who started it all off. The first taste of delicious, like the dried blood of meat on tongues, teaching want without why or how. Ghosts hung along a mapped highway of dead roads. We became the spirits roaming the topography. What does unfamiliar feel like beyond the senses? Ghosts of what we were haunting, leaving our skin of the spode trauma kind. I'm just gonna read a couple from the Mobius Strip Club of Grief. Um, Odin plucked out his eye in exchange for a drink from Mimer's well of wisdom. He wanted to know everything there is to know of the past and future, and so it was. But the weight of wisdom made his face sour, seeing everything blown to shit, the gods with it. And after that, he never ate again and lived on a strict diet of alcoholic beverages at the Mobius Strip Club of Grief. At the Mobius Strip Club of Grief, come on in. The ladies are XXX. If you want the skinny ones, we've got skeletons cracking around those poles. And over at the bar, there's grandma with her breasts hanging to her stomach, gorgeous with a shook Manhattan, and murderous with a maxi pad. At the Mobius Strip Club of Grief, all the drinks are free. Grocery store rosé and gallon bottles on every table. And the dead don't want your tips. They want you to listen to their poems. Don't do anything dangerous and call every once in a while. In fact, they tip you at the MSCOG with a check. With a sigh, they'll throw one down at your feet. We make it rain with checks. Then the dead are sitting at the back of the club, dying further, sniffing, shuffling into the bathrooms, holding their skin in their hands farting methane and sobbing across the stage with their last meal. It's the raciest show in town. And ladies, there's men too, hanging themselves on the bathroom doors and from the rafters, totally naked with their cocks in their hands, tears coming down their faces. Ladies, you'll love how their feet smell, how their bones protrude, how they leave no note. All the single mothers. At the Mobius, a Mobius strip has a surface with only one side, only one boundary. It cannot be its own mirror image. Just as a family is deformed by symmetry, our favorite kind of beautiful here. When the men came, they came in Doppler shifts, frequency fading the moment they passed by. The rest of their voices pitch 
was relative to the air. And when we were born, we listened to them fade away as if they were never there. I just did a little interview about this poem. So I wanted to read it because it's just on the mind today. It's called Emily Dickinson. Um, some night she comes to act as courier, midwife to our own skills. Emily come like a UFO to implant her genius in us. Our queen Mab condemned to be the only woman mentioned in the lyric omnibuses of her epic. Easy scapegoat for men's centuries. She stood in for all women. So now of course she comes to blow off steam in the privacy of the green room. All those living years she walked from yard to yard Gardens flourished with opium poppies. She went out at night to see the owls and wed her genius. She applied her passion like a hot iron sword and no one can take off her clothes ever. She comes and her language takes them off of us, not piece by piece, not fumbling buttons, but all at once in a single shot, her tiny palms like grenades that fit in the hand. And we here bask in the debris, stripped down to our private parts, the snow white of the bone, the authentic corpse in heat, the absolute original. Apocrypha. It is said that Jesus couldn't admit to himself that he was a simile, that he hung out with tax collectors and whores, that he was profound allegory and data compression. He said he'd explain later, but rarely did. He fostered over a billion abandoned children. Whenever he saw someone remodeling a home, he would volunteer his skills, sanding the drywall until the scene was virtually seamless. They say he was jealous of Osiris, that the last thing he sucked on was vinegar from a sponge lifted up on a hyssop plant. And who can explain it to the literalists? He said no man could spiritually mature without being also a woman, no woman without becoming a man. Peter hates all my sex. Mary Magdalene wept to him one day. Whenever Jesus saw a horse standing in a field in the rain, totally still with its eyes closed, he fell into a depression because he knew he could never see through humanity through such an education. They say his favorite thing to do on Passover was dunk an egg in salt water and feed it to Mary. They say that a man named Simon also went around calling himself Christ suffered in Judea and paired with a redeemed harlot. It was common knowledge that Jesus was everyone, loved Mary Magdalene best of all of the disciples and that all women surrounding him were named Mary, confusing on purpose. That the myth was created to make a tangible basis for comparison. That because of him, Rilke thought life was a series of coded messages and in conversation Rilke spoke as if in spells as naturally as adverbs in any way we are all manifestations of that like a fungus we are the fruit of a network linking plants through minute cords of mycelium they say that god is the oldest tree in the universe that Jesus was simply a Douglas fir, that in the beginning, a stone was flung into the air and it snapped into a bird that made the sound of a phone ringing, that the bird shat on the head of a primeval woman who was giving birth to fraternal twins in a field of thistles, and that each twin went out into the world dazed, ignorant, lost, that it was all part of the great big plan. They say that relative to our desires, our goodness is overwhelming, that living is tragic comedy, 
that we seek what is good for the limited idea of good. And we should go bigger, that we were unsavable, but already saved, that we partied so well, that we never had through the wall to confess, that we were forgiven from birth, that it was just a matter of remembering. The last poem I'm going to read is called The Way Things Were Up Until Now. I'm bored of all the excuses, bored as Mayakovsky at the Finnish painter's exhibition, barking like a dog through the foreign minister's toast until he cried and sat down. Deadly serious. I am bored as an elegy. I mean, why care at all, speaking as a pitfall in a world of pits? But we do to the death. We all agree to garden this year, and my raspberry bushes picked over by wrens, I'll make them great again and let America go wild. It'll be all trumpets and leeks and lilacs from here on out. Let's stop paying for it, get it free. Let's plant our victory gardens to supplement grief, boost morale, as though something new and uncontrolled were available. It is the original new hot future joy, and we're making it out of dough. And the illusion of separateness, let it go back into remission. Just look at you. You look like a resurrected child, a serious drama in a cosmic joke, scarred, masked, dangerous. And what of the new Eucharist? How hungry I always am. How I long to lack. Though in Walmart, my heart beats a little faster. And I want the world to heal up. And the world is a field. As if it were indeed flat, curving and caving. As if it were a piece of paper, a Gustave Dore engraving from the Divina Commedia, the one with the silhouettes of Dante and Beatrice standing in front of the blinding, exploding white rose that you realize when looking more closely is all made up of bodies and wings twisting together, the saintly throng, they call it, mashed and hurtling, an image of heaven and the creation of angels, though it is frenzied as any image of hell around a divine nipple, Odin's lost eye in the well, the drain to the other side, joy that gets more frantic the more you try to quiet it down. Thank you. I'm excited to talk now. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, well, so this is the part of the the evening where uh, Bianca and Shanta Lee have a conversation about ghetto claustrophobia and, and poetry. So go, I'm excited. And please, if you have any questions, uh, type them into the chat and we'll, we'll get to them as well, the audience members. Um, can you tell us, let me see, uh, so maybe Shanta Lee, can you tell us a little bit about the, um, more about family and, and beyond. Let's let's go into that perhaps to start. I think part of you got cut off. So tell you more about family and I think that's and poetry. It. Oh <laughs> poetry. Yeah, that's what right, right. That's all you need is family and um it's it's interesting because I so talking about my family or processing or reporting on my family started in my journal when I was like, what, between 12 and 14, just writing in my journal and hey, reporting on my family. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to you live from yes. the chaos. <laughs> Like I literally have pages. They're like, she did this today, and the she is my mother or something, my father or whatever. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, it is true. It's a sort of like, what is this? Like a play by play um, part. Of, and I started revisiting those. I'm a lifelong journaler, and I yeah, poetry was my first language, but along with speaking to the notebook pages, because uh, I couldn't speak to anyone in my house, and so. 
I wanted to test my memory to see if things are really as jacked up. Like, did I imagine it or was that true? And, but then somehow, sometimes it made it into the poetry, but I would say it was still just juvenilia. And then taking a break from poetry and then coming back to it. Um, I guess I'm kind of surprised that it showed up in this way, honestly, because I've been working on my memoir and that's where I imagine that it would live, but it seeped out into this form. Um, yeah. Well, it's hard to escape your own narrative in your poetry since, you know, poetry is unique in that it deals so closely with your own experience. Um, and, uh, you know, in other words, you're not sort of like, the job of poetry is and sort of like to create characters and right. um, come up with a story that's outside of your own experience. Um, but it's also a perfect place to explore family issues because I think, Shanta, we talked about this in our discussion, but like the veil of, uh, of truth, you know, poetry deals in truth so heavily, but but it also has that um, really crucial element of um, not being beholden to truth. And so you can really get at the complexities of family dynamics um, that are really complicated when it comes to truth and like what happened and, you know, um, who did what. It's like, it's like you can really find that that area of exploration and um you know it's all wrapped up with like fantasy and um imagination and uh you can like i did in my book like sort of like exist in this made up landscape uh that's outside of reality but i like to think of it as like a mini reality that i created and not just like allegory or something um so yeah, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to write about family, but I find it unavoidable. Yeah, I was gonna actually ask you about that because I feel like you went so there, like a lot of your work goes so there, it does, it's unflinching and it's not dealing with, I mean, I've been having a really hard conversation recently about, um, you know, my work. And I'm like, I told this person, I said, I'm sorry, I don't do flowers. You know, I don't write about flowers and trees in that way. If they appear in my poems, there's something really interesting. So can you tell me, I'd love to know like behind the Mobius strip reef, like how did that come to you and how, how did the themes of, you know, loss and grief and this strangeness, which I so enjoy about it. Like, how did that figure into the page for you? Um, well, the grief was easy because, I mean, the book started, the poem started as elegies, um, after my grandma died, um, which was my first experience with loss, um, and, you know, she was such an important person in my life, she was like, you know, Part, you know, she helped me raise me and everything. So, you know, we all went losing a mother is like a big deal um, emotionally, you know, the world changes once they're gone. Um, and that's, that's just not something that a poet can, I mean, most, I just can't see not that not being something you have to wrestle with in your poetry. But, uh, but at the same time, I found it kind of unappealing. Um, and a lot of the poems I felt like were very personal that I didn't really want to share. Um, I found it hard to be fresh or something in my elegies. Um, I also found it to be, I was experiencing a lot of complex feelings um, that I didn't know how to articulate. Um, even now, looking back at that book and having come so far from that time, I see a lot more of what was happening to me then. 
and I see, and I see a lot of the illusions and the associations in the book that I wasn't even aware of at the time, um, which is such an amazing thing about poetry too. But the Mobius strip of grief was a poem of my grandmother, so that that title really fit into how I was feeling, and and that poem really resonated in a different way now that she was gone and. The strip club came really randomly in just a like moment of pop, just popped into my head and I just like wrote this poem thinking it was just like not going to be something that it would ever see the light of day, but I just kept going with it. Um, you know, you can kind of tell when something's grabbing you and, you know, you can feel that and I felt that pull and it was really my way into talking about something I didn't want to talk about. Um, I think but, uh, yeah I don't get I don't understand it necessarily entirely which is good I think that's the beauty of it though right like that's the mat like the magic of I feel like if we were to totally understand it then wouldn't I don't know for me personally I don't want to totally understand it because that's part of the mystery mm -hmm. of getting it on the page or creating whatever we're creating in the world. Yeah, I just like, I was like, I mean, I, I'm, I feel the same way. I only worry, I'm like, what if it's, what if what I'm doing is actually fucked up? Like, and I, you know, like, I don't want to be like, I don't understand it, but actually it's kind of fucked up or something. Um, that would be a bad instance of that, but, but that's the risk you take, you know? Um, Somebody asked a question here. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say there was like I think a, a question popped up. It was a lot of questions actually. Yeah, a good ones. Let's see. Oh, we can jump in and, and ask those for you if you want to. You guys don't have to wait through them. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first one we got was a great one um, from Kiev asking, "How do the living members of your family receive your poems about the intimate past, the family of the collection?" I haven't sent my book yet to my family members. Um, that's that's my answer. I I am uh, scared shitless to tell you the truth. There's some stuff in there um, that kind of just came out um, that I did not intend to write, but it just sort of there it is. And yeah, I I don't yeah I did, I, did, I they're getting the book. But I didn't send it to them yet, and I'm not sure if I'm going to answer any questions. Um, even though I did have just, and I'll just wrap with saying this: uh, one of my mother's sisters did say to me, as she was telling me all these crazy stories of her and my mother, and my other aunt. I, I don't really talk to my parents; they're alive, but we're strange. Um, or challenged relationship, I should say. It's on and off again. Um, and so I said to her. A couple of years ago, I said, oh, I get it. I know how I'm going to write about the family. It has to be a work of fiction. She said, no, I want to be myself. And I want to pick who plays me in the movie. <laughs> and I just started laughing. I was like, okay. Like there was total encouragement almost to tell. And I, I don't know. So again, but that's different. It's different saying it versus how people are going to react to what they see in print. Yeah. Bianca, what's your answer to that? Yeah, I think, you know, this question comes up a lot and I, you know, I definitely with students, I, they have a lot of problems with that and they don't, and they're scared. Um, and it's a really good thing to talk about. I think for me, you know, especially with my last book that was so much about Ruth, um, my, you know, I don't have a bit the biggest family. It's pretty small. Um, and um, the ones that were closest to grandma were really excited about it because they knew all the references that nobody else is going to know. Like, oh yeah, grandma always wore Birkenstocks and she always drank like shitty wine. And, um, you know, it's, and she would always scream about letting the cats out and stuff like that, you know, like little things like that. I think they really enjoyed. Um, and I, and I felt good that, you know, because Ruth was such like, 
the beloved poet in the family and everybody like worshiped her writing. I think I was just glad that they, you know, people, I was glad, I felt glad that they were enjoying my poetry and um, not like, oh, this one didn't, isn't up to Ruth's standards or something. I don't know. Um, of course that, Graham and I were so close like poetry wise and like emotionally that like, I don't think that would have been a possibility but it could have been. Um, I just say though with, it's probably the biggest, you know, there's certain things that I won't write about until certain people are gone um, for sure. But I know I did take some risks in my last book and I was worried about it with my mother and um, she was like freaking out, loving my book, reading it in real time and texting me. And then I could tell she'd gotten to that poem um, and she was furious at me and didn't talk to me for a while and then got over it. But still was mad about that poem until she stumbled across a review of it, of my book in the Kenyan Review. And um, the wonderful girl who reviewed it um, wrote about a lot about that particular poem. And my mom, and this was not that long ago that this happened, that she came across it and she wrote me and she was like, I read the review and I didn't understand the poem. Now I do. And it's really beautiful. And I, you know, I'm sorry and I love it. Um, so that was like a real breakthrough, I think, like family wise. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of like honesty can come out of that. And that's like a personal part of like being a poet, right? It doesn't have anything to do with the reality of your book, right? I mean, it's like your book is out there. It's not you anymore. It's not about your fucking family anymore. It's poems that are for the reader now. And I think understanding that and like owning that and and it's it's liberating and it's important and it's like it's it's what has to happen but unfortunately the obviously the reality is um different but I don't know I agree with you though there's something there is something of a division between like yourself and the work you know um my family is very religious on both sides of my family mm. Um, we just don't talk about what, you know, and, but it's interesting because sometimes as I'm either doing a photo shoot or whatever I'm talking about or reading about, um, you know, it, it doesn't prevent me from doing the work I need to do that I want to put out in the world. But it, that, because of what you were just saying about the divide between the work that's going to be viewed or experienced by the reader versus it being about a family member or a relationship or specific people in it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's another question here um, from Sky. Uh, uh, she says uh, about, a, about the interlude section of ghetto claustrophobia. She says, okay. I noticed visually that that section of the book is markedly different from the rest as each poem is nested within squares. She wonders about your decision to format the poems in such a unique way. What was the impetus behind rendering that particular section of the book like that? That's a good question. Um, I wanted to separate it from the rest because it felt like it was, well, so um, I also have belly dance. And so I think about choreography and I think about, so if the page were a stage, where's the eye going? How to give the eye and the body rest. Um, not to say the body and the eye needed rest in the book, but then I thought about, oh, an interlude and what this, this uh, section was actually born out of a uh, prompts, like I usually I don't like prompts, even though I give prompts, but <laughs> sometimes I don't like prompts either. But um, I kept going with it and going with it. And it felt like this section of prose poetry, setting it apart from some of the other forms that are in the book, so that the reader could, again, treating it like a piece of choreography, so that the reader 
could experience this section of the book, perhaps a little bit different than the rest. So even the choice to have it in italics, I didn't want it to um, all run together. Also, because it moves, um, you know, back, present, forward, like it's moving in all these ways. I also thought about whether the reader is going to have motion sickness and how to stabilize reader in that way as a break so they could be read individually or you could read that whole section together. So there's a great question from Claire for both of you. Um, she asks, were there moments in the writing of your poems on family that changed and transformed your own emotional story going forward? You want me to start? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you start. Yeah, I mean, I think they touched on that a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I think writing poetry is a transformative experience, especially putting a book together. Um, I've come to realize that. And I think it's important to think about it like that because you really want to discover things when you're writing um, because then the reader ends up, I mean, that's why I read poetry, right? So I read poetry to feel transformed. Um, great poetry helps me grow. Um, and that's what I want to do with my poetry for other people. The process of writing it is very laborious and complicated and messy. And I think with all the work that goes into it, you can't help but emotionally grow, I think. Um, especially for me, because I'm so, I've become so obsessed with human thought and um, how it translates onto the page and our ways we communicate with each other and um, what it means to, you know, because so much of human thought is suffering. Um, and I think a lot of my poems are an exploration of suffering um, to transmute it. And there's a lot of humor there and there's a lot of wryness there. And uh, it's not all like it's sad at all, but um, I think ultimately suffering seems to be a major occurrence in humanity mentally um, as well as physically, but um, yeah, just exploring that in poems, like I've found, you know, this past year has been insane. Like I've just gone through such a transformation. I think we all have obviously, but um, it's, it's traceable in my poems. Um, like my next book is like, uh, it, it wasn't on purpose. That's just how it happens, you know? Like, it's cool to like look back at other poets, tr you know, trajectory and see their transformations of self, you know, tr in the poems and that's that's mirrored in their biography. Um, it's all it's all wrapped up together, right? So I, and I, and I don't wanna stay stagnant. I wanna, um, I wanna evolve. I'm going to piggyback off that because um, the this is going to sound strange, even though there might be some different kinds of truths and sharp edgy truths in the book. I had a lot of joy and enjoyment of um, almost like going into a state of putting something on the page, not knowing what was gonna come out, being surprised by it. This is actually, um, yeah, it's like a first time in a serious way that I've written about growing up in Hartford. Um, but I also, I wanted to transform ghetto. And so like the title poem, shows people how to read the whole book because I do not want ghetto to be associated with a specific group of people or groups of people. And so I wanted to re-own that and think of like, well, how are, you know, but like the, giving the definition poem. Um, but also 
after a lot of time with the material and then putting it down and then it living in the body and then looking at lines and editing and you know all those cycles I notice what I've done for my second and third manuscripts, books, behind the scenes. Um, the second one is, goes in a different direction and away from me, away from the personal. Like obviously there are some traces, but it deals with something else. I was doing something else. And the third one that started to spill out deals with even something way more different almost like giving me an opportunity to play in a certain way. Um, and Bianca, as you were saying about like growing and evolving, I kind of see it like that. And it's almost like, you know, I wasn't necessarily, I would never say, oh, I was dealing with some stuff in this and this is my pro It wasn't necessarily that, it just sort of like, you know, some of these poems are way older than 2018, but I didn't never realize that they were going to see the light of day and be in a collection. It was just sort of like they were, I was giving them some rest time and then picking them back up. Um, yeah, I hope, I don't feel like I answered the question, but I hope I did. Did I? I think you did. <laughs> I think I did. I think yeah. so too. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there's another qu great question here, a larger one about poetry for both of you from Emily. She says, uh, can you talk about how you navigate the territory of language, the long history of poetry and poetries, the quirks of modern speech, and also your own internal cadences? Mm. Navigating the territory of language, Emily. I'm just staring at your frozen picture right now. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is an important question because we talked a lot about theme and history coming into poetry, but I would say that first and foremost is words um, and cadence and that oddly enough doesn't get a lot of attention when talking about how poetry is um, talking in conversations because it's just not as easy to talk about maybe. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because poetry is um, figurative language that's very condensed. And that's not how we talk in real life. Um, but at the same time, there's a essential, I mean, it's at least in contemporary poetry, a simplicity and conversational tone that also can be extremely powerful. So it's sort of finding relevance in those two things and combining them um, when it's appropriate. Um, but also just delighting in language itself is, is really something that oddly people overlook sometimes in their own practice because they're so obsessed with creating a, a, a pretty moment or something or like a, an insightful moment right like the focus is so on like like so much effort on like being profound but actually profundity can like happen naturally if you focus more on um on the on on your own brain's delight in in the sound of words and the coolness of words and I have lots of books around me all the time when I'm writing and I look at them for language and I pick up on other people's language and I put words in that I haven't used before. And I, you know, we all fall back onto our same words. Fuck, it's so annoying. I was writing today and I just was like, I just kept using the same words. I kept writing the same lines I've already written. I'm like, I hate that feeling. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think you, is this idea of internal cadence as well is, is interesting. Um, but we do get these sort of internal rhythms that are sort of our, our music, our beat that, that we write our poems to. Um, all those factors are important in making a poem. It's like, you know, and, ex and you get to experiment with, with all of those different ones. And 
um, then when a poem's not working, you're sort of figuring out which one of those is the thing that's not working. I and mean, that's like the nightmare, right? That's why you have workshop, essentially. Um, yeah. All right, I've gone on enough, Shanta, help. <laughs> it's, it, you know, everything you said is so true. And it's funny because when you said um, internal language or secret language, um, our friend, Michael Ruby, that's almost like he spends a lot of time thinking about that, like internal language and what are like your the words and things you return to. Um, but it also is interesting because the language I rejected and the way I was guarded, told not to talk, um, mm -hmm. what we would know as um, Black English vernacular, which I, I I have mixed feelings about all that, African-American vernacular, all of that. I, um, a few years ago, someone, you know, they said, why? It's so lyrical. And I would encourage you to go revisit that. And the reason why I wasn't even revisiting or doing anything with it were a couple of reasons, partly um, societal assumptions, mm -hmm. stigma, shame, and then deciding, fuck it you know, that's not even coming from a place of agency for myself. If I'm going to say, well, I'm staying away from that because I talk like this, right? So I decided to lean into it in a big way in the book. Um, and also in my memoir, um, I decided to speak in two different languages in the memoir. And of course, as I'm working with it, I'm thinking, who's going to buy this, I don't know. But it like, I started to really, um, cause I think it's different, obviously the prose, but I think like poetry to remember the opportunity for imagination and like sound and rhythm and feeling and the body and uh, thinking about sense of permission and thinking about going over boundary lines when we're looking at language. Um, so navigating the language, I mean, that that is such an interesting question. Because, and I, and I also have been fascinated because I'm also a photographer and Bianca, you work in other mediums too. I think of the way that other things, and I love film and I love horror film. I am a horror fan. I, I love that stuff. And it's like it, the, all the different things for me that are texts. I break into abandoned buildings. Yes, it is illegal, but I, I like that too. Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> and they are texts. Like when, you know, when I've seen or been inside of abandoned asylums, they're texts. And so thinking about the way that things before language and after language and in between language and all the things that language can be. Cause I think that there's, you know, I, I like watching people. Bodies are texts in different kind of texts. You know, it's interesting because it's interesting really thinking about the evolution of poetry since the dawn of man. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it is really, a, a visual thing on the page, right? I mean, right. why have line breaks if it's not? Um, and I think poets delight in in that. I mean, that, that's like such a huge part of it, right? Um, is its composition on the page and looking at it visually. Um, but that's not the only thing that's happening in poetry. It's also an oral art. Um, way more than fiction. Um, so it's really about embodying the poem. That's why musicality is so important in poetry because as a reader, I am embodying the poem and it's reading it out loud. I, I feel it um, in my mouth. I feel it in my skin. If, if it's done right, if the music is there and the sound of the words, mixed with the associations that I have with the language um, and listening to, this, to the story of the poem, um, all those things combined is really a physical occurrence. So I think um, it, it, it's very important to think of, of the, way that, the way that we talk versus 
you know, making a lyric, you know, uh, it's, it's different. Um, and you're doing it so that you can get somebody into a different state of communication than just communicating like we are right now, or um, usually communication is about being very clear so that you can give instructions so that we can all be on the same page. Whereas like, right, poetry is like communicating in a different way. Um, that's something more mystical going on. So, well, we really took that and ran with it, but um, <laughs> yeah. Well, after you were saying about wonderful. the physical, it's like, I think of Emily Dickinson as an example, like, yeah. you know, how, she, they, you know, her and several other poets reach in and there's something, right? Yeah, Emily Dickinson's such an interesting, I mean, there's no one like Emily Dickinson. It's no. like, and what she does to me sonically is so odd. I can't, Ditto. it's, it, it's I, I can't think of any other poet like her. Um, Who does that, that, right? Like it's a thing, like I, I was like, sometimes I dip in and then I have to put it back. It's almost like the book or the words are burning. Cause it's like, there's like, I don't I, know. I yeah, can't. same. I, I yeah. can only read little bits of her at a time. Um, right. Whereas like I could read a Larry Levis book for an hour, um, but it's like, it doesn't mean one's better or worse, but there is something very impactful sonically about Emily Dickinson that's very disorienting and beautiful and like profound and strange. Mm -hmm. And it would be really, I'm sure there's books on it. And I'm I th actually, I'm thinking the Helen Vendler book, I think even goes here, but like the, to, to really investigate what's going on sonically with um, Emily Dickinson would be would, would be a really interesting thing to read about. Mm -hmm. That's a great place to, I think to end, zero at the bone. Um, and uh, what a wonderful event we've had tonight, Chantilly. Bianca, thank you both so much. Um, you can order Ghetto Claustrophobia from Northshire Bookstore. We've got the link in the chat. Likewise, the Mobia Strip Club of Grief. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And thank you, Northshire, for putting together this event. And Bianca, thank you. Thank I you, Shanta. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, buy this book if you don't have it. You better all have it. OK. <laughs> it's crazy. All right, guys, have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Have a good thank evening. You, everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.